Hello and welcome to Something Rhymes with Purple, the podcast about words and language and just general musings really on life, who we meet. And by we, I mean me, Susie Gent, and my brilliant co-host, Giles Brandreth. And Giles, I have to say, I was just noticing you doing what Anne Robinson does on Countdown, the game show that I work on, which was you were sipping something with a straw. Now, I think Anne does it because she doesn't want to ruin her lipstick. <laughs> what, what are you up to? I drink every morning now herbal tea. Ah. And I'm finding that drinking it through a straw makes it more interesting because it's the, it's the closest <laughs> I get to excitement in my life is drinking this herbal tea. I'm on my low-carb diet drinking herbal tea in the morning and then in the mm-hmm. afternoon I treat myself to one cup of green tea. Anyway, sucking it through ah. the straw has made a difference. I saw uh, your friend, Anne Robinson, last week, and she spoke very highly of you. Uh-huh. Yes, I went to a, a publisher's party, and there she was. The name-dropping I could do this week would embarrass even me. So I'm going to try yes. and resist the temptation to tell you about... Okay. Yes, well, I must resist the temptation then. Good. To tell us about the Queen. Yeah, exactly. Um, I could start with the Queen. I could end with the Prime Minister. I could do most of the crowned heads of Europe in between, but I won't. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you could just sprinkle a few here and there. I think we would love to hear them. What are we going to talk about today? Well, it's interesting. I'm in high spirits. You're drinking, yes, you're in high spirits and you were drinking (laughs) herbal tea with a straw because that's as glamorous as you and I get. But actually, we are going to talk about different kinds of spirits. The spirits that we drink that you no longer partake in, but the alcoholic kind. We've covered, haven't we, I think, alcohol before, uh, the world of wine, etc. And just essentially the vast lexicon for being drunk, particularly in the slang dictionary. But this is the hard stuff we're going to talk about today. Can you tell me, before we begin, and I want to ask about your first experience with spirits, mm. what is the difference between wine and spirits? I mean, I know they always refer to them as wine and spirits. Yeah. Wine, I assume, is made of grapes and spirits is made of something else. Is that the difference? Yeah. So spirits is essentially the kind of essence or a distilled extract. So it's an alcoholic solution or distillation, if you like, of a specified substance. And there was amongst the early alchemists, there was spirit of amber, spirit of heart's horn, spirit of salt, spirit of sulfur, spirit of vitriol. And there was spirit of wine as well, actually. And in fact, that was the earliest spirit recorded, the spirit of wine. So it was a really concentrated distillation of it, if you like. And so that's why this is the strong stuff, because as I say, it is highly, highly concentrated. And why is it called a spirit? What is the reason for that being the word? Yeah, I think it's called the spirit because the spirit is essentially something that is the central component, but part of our core, if you like. So obviously it's got extreme religious connotations for the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is, if you like, again, a sort of distillation of all that is kind of good. And that is why I think it was then transferred over to things that represent our essential well, our essence, I think, is the way that, that we would do it. And then, of course, we talked about high spirits. You know, it, it kind of branched off into lots of different directions. And the word is Latin spiritus, yeah. French esprit. Um, yeah. What is the root, root, root of spirit? Um, all of those. So obviously in ecclesiastical Latin, the spirit, as I say, has a sort of deeply sort of uh, spiritual meaning for an animating or kind of vital principle, I suppose. You know, the thing that gives life to the body, the life force, the breath of life, as in contrast to its kind of purely material being. So it came to us ultimately from Latin, but as so often it came to us via the Normans. And so we took esprit from French and we made it in our Anglo-Norman kind of mashup, esprit. And then we dropped the E at the beginning and just had spirit in the end. Can you remember the first spirits you ever drank? I can. So my first alcoholic uh, journey was not a very happy one really I don't think cider is a spirit really so cider was the first drink that I ever really had it was extremely sick it was at a friend's 15th birthday party never to be repeated I'm not sure actually I have ever had cider since then which is very sad but my first spirit I think was trying some rum and coke at a party and deciding that it was mm, really nice but in the end I preferred the coke bit so I don't really have a very strong love affair with spirits I quite like cocktails and obviously they are an essential ingredient in those so I think an elderflower gin fizz is my current cocktail of choice on the few occasions I actually get to sample one but um, how about you what was your first encounter well quite I remember it 
too vividly as a child because I went a lot to France on sort of holiday exchanges. I got used to drinking wine. And often in France, they would give children wine diluted with water. So that was part and parcel of my childhood. And my parents on high days and holidays would have wine. But my first drink of spirit, it was the beginning of my gap year between school and university. I'd met a girl whose father was, I think, either the chairman or the chief executive of Shell, mm. a huge international oil yeah. company. And she invited me to her house, which was in London in Regent's Park, because her father was very kindly going to give me some letters of introduction, because I was going to America, age 17, 18, and he was going to introduce me to various people over there. So it was very exciting. And I went and sat in the drawing room, this huge drawing room, this wonderful house. I'd never been anywhere where the carpets were so thick and uh, you know, your feet disappeared, I felt, into the carpet. Anyway, I sat nervously on a chair and the great man, you know, questioned me and told me. Well, anyway, he served me a drink and I didn't really know what to ask for. So he was having whiskey. So I said, well, thank you, sir. He gave me this tumbler full of whiskey and I sat on the far side of the room and took a sip of this and my eyes began to water. I thought, I can't drink this. What am I going to do? So the girl... I think her name was Cordelia. The girl was sitting in another corner. Her mother was sitting in another corner. The great man was sitting in the third corner. And I was in the fourth corner. I did not know what to do. <laughs> so as the conversation wore on, I lowered, I sat towards the front of my chair, and I lowered the glass, the tumbler, towards my feet. And I began pouring into your shoe, the whiskey please tell me that. into oh. my shoe. Into my shoe. And I was really happy because I managed to get all the, I mean, you know, my socks absorb the, the moisture. And I thought, this is marvellous. So I occasionally appeared to take a sip, and then I put the glass down, poured a little bit more away, took another sip. And so by the time the <laughs> encounter was over, I had appeared to consume the whole glass of whiskey. Then, unfortunately, I had to get up, cross the yes. room to say and goodnight to Cordelia's carpet. parents. Absolutely. And as I walked, splodge, splodge, no. splodge. Nobody said anything. <laughs> But I never saw Cordelia again. And the father's letters did come in the introduction, and I met some very high-powered people in America as a result of it. But I still feel deeply ashamed of those brown stains on that beautiful cream-coloured cream. carpet oh, in Regent's Park. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh. So that's haunted me since the middle of the 1960s. Good grief. That's my first encounter with spirits. But I realised how innocent one must have been as a child because later, the same year, was it, maybe it was a little later, I, I found myself in, in France and ordering a whiskey. I, oh. I mean, I knew I didn't like it because other people were doing it. I felt it was a thing to do. And it was at a seaside. We'd gone to a place to meet, believe it or not, Jean-Paul Sartre. You've heard of him? I certainly have. Yeah, but he wasn't there. That's the long and the short of it. Wherever it was, he wasn't there. We'd been taken to this bar. He was supposed to be there. It was somewhere out on, on the coast somewhere. So I got this whiskey. And on this occasion, I didn't put it into my shoe. I poured it over the edge of the sort of parapet down some rocks. So it was literally whiskey on the oh, rocks. That's fantastic. And I thought nobody would notice. But the noise in the still night air of the whiskey trickling down the rocks. <laughs> Again, uh, humiliation. Why do we keep doing Anyway, now, uh, if people offer me a whiskey, I say, no, I don't. Uh, thank you. I don't, well, I don't, you don't drink? drink at all. I don't drink. No. And do you remember the origin of teetotaler? No, I'd love to know that. Oh, what is it? It's simply from the idea that it's kind of total, as in total abstinence, with a capital T. So it's underscoring the T in total. Oh. So a teetotaler is absolute abstention. A total abstention. Yes. Tea total. You're underlining the T. I never knew that. Yes. That's why, honestly, that's why people tune in to <laughs> Something Rhymes With Purple, because you, Susie Dent, know it all. Well, given you know it all, tell me about whiskey. We've started with whiskey. Yeah. And why Irish whiskey has an E in it and the other whiskeys oh. don't. Where does the word whiskey yeah, come that's from? that's a really, really good point. I don't know why the Irish version has a whiskey in it i've always just seen the two as kind of being variants one of each other i'm just going to see if it gives us any steer in the oxford english dictionary uh no it's taken me straight to bourbon actually or bourbon i should say which is named after bourbon l'archambault which is a town in the department of l'allier in france so there you go but no it doesn't actually tell me why there is an e in one and not in the other it just does give them both side by side but anyway i can tell you that the word uh, however you want to spell it, comes from the late 16th century in a Gaelic word, which was usquebu, which is spelled U-S-Q-U-E, 
B-A-U-G-H. And it simply means Oogh. water of life. So eau de vie, in other words, is another name for it. We're almost back to spirit, aren't we? Exactly. In a yeah. sense, what it is. Exactly. Uh, the fundamental, central. vital ah. part of, ah. of us, our fundamental essence. Vodka. I don't know how you used to feel about vodka, but vodka comes from the Russian meaning little water, which all sounds quite innocent. My experiences of vodka have not been so innocent. I used to adore vodka, a Bloody Mary, oh, yeah. a, what was it called when you had orange juice and vodka? Is that, um, anyway, I loved that. Do you miss drinking? No, not at all. Not at no. all. But I, I'm happy talking about these old days. I used to love a vodka and orange juice. Okay. During that gap here in America, that's when I really discovered that. The vodka and the, the gin I could cope with. It was the brown stuff, the whiskey that I didn't like. Well, the gin itself, I think we covered this actually in, in um, one of our previous episodes on drinking, but that's from the old French Genève. And actually, that is a confusion with Geneva. And also with the Latin juniperus, and juniperus was essentially juniper, because of course gin is flavoured with juniper berries. But because juniperus, you know how we tend to kind of take a foreign word and think, hmm, what does this sound like? Well, the French did it as well. They took juniperus and thought it sounds a little bit like Genève, which means Geneva. And uh, so that's what they called it. And rum. We're not completely sure about rum, but it possibly comes from rumbullion. Now, rumbullion mm. was an old dialect word meaning a great tumult or uproar. And of course, rum has got such a sort of long naval history, isn't it? That actually it's quite possible that Devon sailors took the word over to Barbados. And because rum is very, very strong, they decided to call it rumbullion because it causes all sorts of upset some noise. Sailors used to be given a tot of rum, didn't they, as part of yes. their daily ration? they did. OK, so what about, oh, is tequila a kind of rum? No, te- it's definitely a spirit, isn't it? Yes, it is. So you get tequila shots. Have you ever done lots of tequila shots? No. No, I'm, I'm, I'm of an older generation. I know with the tequila shots, what they're little glasses and people don't knock them back yes. until they fall over. Have you done exactly. that sort of thing? I've done a few tequila shots. Not my favourite, but it is more of a kind of ritual, I think, and the sort of you know, the group thing rather than the pleasure of the drink itself, in my experience anyway. But it's named after the town in Mexico where tequila was invented. And I'm just going to see if it tells us what it was made of, actually, Um, whether it's some exotic Mexican plant. Yes, the fermented sap of a maguey. And a maguey, I think, might possibly give us, you know, agave syrup, which people use as sweeteners these days. I think it might be related to that. So maguey or maguey, M-A-G-U-E-Y, that gave us tequila. Very good. When my father was at school, because his surname was Brandreth, he was nicknamed Brandy. Uh Aha. And people used to love, it was a very popular drink once upon a Mm. time, and people always after dinner would have a brandy and soda. Mm. And I, in my drinking days, used to enjoy a brandy and soda, rolling it around in a sort of balloon-shaped oh, it glass. Oh, beautiful, doesn't and it? And soda from a soda siphon. I loved a soda siphon that you could squirt. Oh, yeah. Great fun. It's funny you should say that, because I was listening on Radio 4, the British radio station. They've repeated, I think, a dramatisation of the 39 steps, John Buchan. Ooh. And it was just, if someone comes in and says, well, I really need a drink. And the host says, well, help yourself. And I just thought, you know, in every sitting room across the country there must have been these silver trays with decanters full of spirits that were just always there and people could literally just walk over to them and then pour themselves a drink it was just standard wasn't it yes which is so not these days and if you watch a program like i do called bargain hunt Mm. often they are selling little silver signs that say things like brandy that people would hang around their decanters i remember Uh, these and, and, and you're right so you had brandy and yeah. then you had a soda side from Bayard and you just sort of, oh, wonderfully uh, evocative. And people used to drink, I think, much, much more. And not quite morning, noon and night, but certainly at lunch and then, you know, before dinner, during dinner, after dinner. Oh, yeah. Great. Okay, so let me just tell you about brandy very quickly. So it's from uh, Dutch, actually, brandewijn, I think, which is burnt, i.e. distilled wine. It's just distilled from wine or grapes, isn't it? And it literally means burnt wine. Burnt wine. burnt wine. And a cherry brandy would be the same thing, but made from cherries. Yeah. Um, With cherries. The, the added same for distillation. Flavor. Yeah. And then there's kirsch, of course, as well, which is oh. a liqueur, isn't it? And that is from cherries. That's German for cherry. Kirsch. I always like the sound of the word schnapps. I'll have a glass of schnapps. Yes. 
So, well, that's German, as you might guess, and there's a Dutch equivalent as well, and schnapps. It basically means a mouthful, but it's a bit like a snack. So it's got that sound of the mouth closing oh. very quickly uh, on it. Schnapps is lethal in my experience. I remember having it in Austria and wow, yes, it is very, the, very strong. The word schnapps means a mouthful, does it? Yes, it does. But as I said, it's got oh. that, that sort of idea of something snapping shut. How intriguing. Mm. What about yes. absinthe? Absinthe. Uh. Okay, so absinthe makes the heart grow fonder famously and that goes back to the latin term for the wormwood plant which is this really bitter and quite medicinal plant and wormwood in german is vermut and actually that gave us vermouth oh, yeah goodness. so all, all linked there i think proper absinthe is now illegal in france i discovered this when going to the celebrations for the centenary of Oscar Wilde's death in 2001. They wanted to serve absinthe because he was partial to a glass of absinthe. It may have helped take him on his way when he was still quite young and in his 40s. And they couldn't get any. They had to have champagne instead. So I think that sort of pure absinthe is now illegal. It's, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty lethal stuff. Anyway, wow, yes, so. I think so too. A hot toddy. So I feel I've got a bit of a cold at the moment and a hot toddy sounds extremely inviting. So that goes back to the Hindi word for sap from palm trees that is fermented and that creates the liqueur that is used in a hot toddy. Um, something just very soothing about the word toddy, I think, because of all of its associations. It's intriguing how so many of these words are, are really international. I mean, we've gone from... From Germany mm. to, to India now, all of a sudden. Well, sake is oh, yes. Japanese. Japanese rice wine. What is sake? Yeah, you have it in very small quantities, don't you? In Japanese, interestingly, sake actually means any kind of drink at all. So they are much more specific when they want to talk about what we would call sake, and that's nihonshu. So if they want any kind of alcoholic drink, they would say they'd have a sake or sake, I suppose. But yeah, if they want what we would call sake, that is Nihonshu. And I'm just, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. It's fermented liquor made from rice. Thank you, the OED. I'm going to allow myself to go off at a tangent for a split second. You mentioned sake, hmm. and that's made me think of sake, S-A-K-I, oh, yeah. which was the pen name of a wonderful English writer called H.H. Munro. Yes. Do you, Susie Dent, know the short stories of sake? I have a copy on my shelves and oh. I remember opening them when I was at university and absolutely loving them, but I now can remember absolutely nothing. Tell me. If you're listening to this and thinking, oh, I don't know what to read this week, get a book, a collection of the stories of Saki. They're ideal bedside reading because they're quite short. They're pithy, they're witty, they're cynical, they're dark. Mm -hmm. There's often a twist in the tale. It's a fantastic world that H.H. H. Munro created using this name, Saki, which I think is an Indian word, S-A-K-I, and probably not at all connected with the Japanese word, S-A-K-E, yeah. which is what we're talking about. Yeah, anyway, absolutely. Okay, uh, good recommendation. Talking of hot toddies, mm -hmm. dram. You take a dram, I, I associate a hot toddy with being with Scotland, don't ask me why, and a dram, I, I definitely, do. a wee dram. What's, what's that? Yeah, well, believe it or not, that's Greek. You said that we're travelling around the Goodness. world. So that's from the Greek drachma, because the weight of the old oh. coin was an eighth of an ounce of alcohol. So if you're having a wee dram, you are having essentially the weight of an old drachma. Goodness. It's interesting, isn't it? Oh, I love it. <laughs> oh, I have to say, I did like when I used to go to Greece in younger and happier days, ouzo. Oh, which... yes. Aniseed. It is. It's like Perno, isn't it? Per yes. Perno is the the French, French. equivalent. And yeah. Perno, I imagine, is a brand. It's a it's a make of uh, yeah. aniseed drink. Yeah. Um, and Ouzo is a version of that, is it? It is. Yeah. So it's clear aniseed flavored. It's an aperitif, isn't it? And we don't quite know where it comes from, but a popular story attached to it is that it comes from the Italian uso massalia, meaning for the use of Marseille, which apparently was stamped on packages of silkworm cocoons that were exported in the 19th century. And that came to stand for something that was superior quality, because of course, silk is very exotic. And the spirit distilled as uso was thought to be this kind of very superior thing. So uh, that's a popular story attached to that it goes back to packages of silkworm cocoons. I loved Uzo because when it came, uh, sort of 
greyish-yellowish colour, and you poured water onto it, and it got a bit cloudy, and you could make the drink last the whole evening if you want. You know, you could pour more and more water. I just loved it. Mm. Oh, oh, I'd forgotten how much I enjoyed ouzo. T- talking like this is not going to get me back on the booze. No. Though we know mo- moderation in all things is good for you. If you could, if just for an evening, if you could go back to alcohol, what would you choose? When my wife and I were in our 20s and we took to having one, if not two, glasses on special days, glasses of champagne before dinner. Oh, wow. And I remember that that was magic. Well, when we, you know, we were staying at a hotel or going out somewhere, just one or two glasses of champagne. More was too much. But the first one got you, oh, and the second one went you, ah. Oh, and there was, a, there was magic in the air, two glasses of champagne. I then, I think, when I got to my 30s, discovered the champagne cocktail. With a champagne cocktail, you had two cubes of sugar, poured on a little brandy, and then you poured on the champagne. Oh, my goodness. But I think it was probably too rich. Did that not but make I it think... just very, very effervescent and fizzy? The sugar gloriously, just, yeah. gloriously effervescent and fizzy. So there are little tickles, little bubbles in your nose. Mm. And we used to have, indeed still have, but don't use, champagne saucers as opposed to flutes. So the champagne was spread across the saucer. So you could hold it under your nose and the little bubbles would tickle your nose. Oh, there wow. was magic I've in never the heard air. of a champagne yeah. saucer. It's called a champagne saucer. It's a champagne glass oh. as opposed to a flute. As you know, the champagne saucer, famously, the shape of it, was modelled on the breast of Madame de Pompadour. I had absolutely no idea. You had no idea? No. This is famous in the, the legend of wine glasses. Oh. The, the shape of the champagne glass, of the, of the saucer, you know, you can picture the bowl I'm talking about, can't you? A look champagne it up. glass. Yeah, look it up. Okay. So a champagne glass, shaped like a bowl, was modelled on the breast oh, of Madame Oh, I know what you mean. I just wouldn't have called them exactly. a, a you, saucer. OK, what, yeah, obviously. What would you have called it? Um, it's known as a champagne saucer, yeah. as opposed to a champagne fruit. I would have called it a coupe, I think. Well, it is a kind of coupe. It yes. is a kind of cup. Yes. A champagne coupe. Okay. It modelled on the breast of Madame de Pompadour. Nobody oh. knows what the champagne flute was modelled on. We don't like to think about that. Oh, very, <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what would be your... If, if you had one... So I've given you my two glasses of champagne. Mm. What would be your absolute favourite drink? I think it would be, as I said earlier, I think it would be a, a gin fizz. So tiny bit of gin, not much. Prosecco and some elderflower cordial. It's delicious. Could you give up alcohol completely? Yeah, I don't drink very much. I did actually, I didn't drink for quite a few years after a few people in my family had breast cancer. And I was reading up on the associations between breast cancer and alcohol. And I I never used to drink that much. So I thought, well, I'm going to reduce my risk. I'm not going to drink. But then sometimes it's just really nice to have a glass of red wine or, you know, a gin fizz. So I don't overdo it at all. I'm such a lightweight, notoriously a lightweight. As we know, moderation in all things we recommend. But if there's anybody listening to this who thinks, oh, maybe I am drinking too much. I had a, a sister, no longer alive, whose life was saved when she joined AA. Mm -hmm. It transformed her life. Mm -hmm. So she had an alcohol issue for many years. And then one day, somebody introduced her to AA and she began going to the AA meetings. And it transformed the rest of her life. So wow. for, you know, the next 30 years, she she was an alcoholic but didn't drink oh, yeah. uh, and also found a, a wonderful community through AA. I recommend it to anybody who feels the need. Go for it. Anyway. Excellent. But at the same time, we in, like people enjoying a drink. If you want to enjoy a drink, do. Cheers. Cheers. Well, well, actually, we must have done that before. What's the origin of cheers? Why do people do toast, toast like that? I suppose it's just saying cheer up, is it? What is it? Uh, cheers saying is cheers. to your very good health. So if you remember, cheers goes back to the Greek kara, meaning head or face. And so people would say, what cheer when they met people in the um, 16th and 17th centuries, meaning how is your mood, i.e. how are you? Because, of course, the face is a reflection of your mood. And do you remember that what cheer became watcher? So when people said watcher, that actually was a shortening of the much, much older greeting, what to cheer. So really, when people come up to you and say, watch a cock, the watcher part is what cheer. What cheer, yeah. Centuries on. It's weird, isn't it? Oh, the whole thing is weird. Well, if you have thoughts and you're listening about the origins of any of these uh, drink names, you think we've got it wrong. We didn't touch on mezcal, did we? Um, now I think of it. 
Do you know about oh, mezcal? Yeah, I don't. I've never ever had mezcal. Have you? Have you ever had it? No. No. Okay. No. Does it come from Mexico? Um, it does come from Mexico, and it is still. Again, I mentioned the agave plant. It's made from the heart of the agave plant, which is called the piña, and it is indeed from Mexico. I think for 16th century. Uh, yeah. So there you go. I mean, that's so exotic. Uh, the, uh, the history of alcohol is, is inevitably, I suppose, global and very, very exotic. I think. I have had mezcal because I went on a trip to Mexico and they very kindly gave me every kind of Mexican food and drink you can imagine. Well, we've really been all over the place. And we should just say that if anybody wants to hear us wittering more enthusiastically about tequila or other things that take our fancy. Do remember, if you'd like to support the show, you can do so for a monthly subscription of um, £1.89 a month, and that will give you ad-free episodes, discount codes on our merch and exclusive bonus episodes. And we've done a three-part mini series on swearing haven't we Giles oh yes and we're going to be doing more poetry and anyway you can find out more if you want to follow the links in the program description but we're really grateful for you listening to us in whatever way you choose now Giles we don't have correspondence today because do you remember we recently encouraged the purple people to write their own sonnets and of mm, course, they didn't did. disappoint. Thank you so much to everybody who submitted their poems. Some were bespoke to the podcast. Others were just brilliant. And we really, really enjoyed reading all of them. And as promised, the winning entry will receive a copy of Jazz's Dancing by the Light of the Moon. So, Jazz, are we ready to reveal the, the winning? I think we are. And, and I would like you to read the poem because I always read the poems, and but I, I love your voice. Oh, gosh, I was going to and ask you, you, because I'm I, not sure I'm going to get the right rhythm to this, because I'm not sure how much I'm in the, the bloodstream of the sonnet, but I can give oh, it a well, go. I think you should give it a okay. go. I mean, the sonnet form, as we know, 14 lines yeah. with a certain rhyming pattern after eight lines is a change of mood. We discussed all that on our episode about sonnets. We challenged people to come up with sonnets, and I think the winning one, which we both agreed on, there were, there were so many, and we may have time in another week to share some others with you. Who yes. knows? But the one we've chosen is, is, is the one you're going to read. Yes, and it's Danny Edmonds. So congratulations, Danny. You get a copy of Giles's brilliant book. And this is an ode to purple. I have to say, we didn't just choose it because we want to congratulate ourselves. I just think it's really, really clever. Okay, here goes. The world has sadly been, well, not that great. Our day by day spent in clouds of anguish, alone, unsure, in fear, self-isolate. But one thing still connects us all, language. Nobody uses words like Susie Dent. They flow in magic dialogue from her, their roots, their histories, and what they meant. She's the greatest lexicographer. Giles Brandreth is her fellow logophile. With word trio, Susie does bestow him. And though he likes to name drop while to while, he always ends with a thoughtful poem. Pod in ears, I walk without a herple. Life is good, for something rhymes with purple. That's so clever. It is it's clever. a proper sonnet and it's delightfully done and we are very flattered by it. And so congratulations. And indeed, I produced a collection of poetry called Dancing by the Light of the Moon, which is an anthology in a sense of, of poems to learn by heart. It contains old ones and new ones. Well, it's fun poetry to read out loud and to have by the bedside. Yeah. So I thought I would, in a moment, I'm going to do one of the poems from it. But first, we want to have from you... Susie, your words of the week, a trio. Yes. Do you think I've got time just to read one more of the sonnets, yes. which we absolutely loved? Because I feel I feel slightly bad that that one felt a bit boastful, that last one. And this, this one also, well, there were just so many. It's rather amusing. Have you seen Donald Trump's letter about his hole in one? <laughs> it's hilarious. Um, no. Donald Trump genuinely managed to, uh, he plays um, golf enthusiastically, and he was playing with some very distinguished international golf players. And Donald Trump secure, got a hole in one. He really did get a hole in one. I mean, it's there. It's been filmed. He got a hole in one. And he issued this amusing statement about this hole in one, boasting about his triumph of getting a hole in one with these great international players. And he ends his statement by saying, people have been asking who actually won the match that he was playing. And he said he he, he couldn't reveal who won the match because if he did, people would think he was boasting and um, mm. bragging is the one thing he doesn't approve of. Well, it shows he's got a sense of humour. Anyway, that, that's ah, by the by. Good you, grief. No, people I can't see Susie. She's got her head in her hands at, at this point. Um, yes. Anyway, 
you're you're allowed to boast. A little bit of gentle boasting is is nice. I know. I feel a bit bad, but um, just I would also like to doff my cap to Jackson the poet, to Claire Dawn Starmer, to Kevin Westerman, and also to Finton O'Higgins because they all produced absolutely wonderful, wonderful sonnets for us. So I'm just going to read you Claire's because it is quite beautiful. When tasked with creating a sonnet of note, with purple as theme and person embed, our fellows outreach to keyboards to pot our thoughts to lilac, magenta and red. Does purple have limits to rhyme and to think, or boundless in impact to define our world? Cerulean lacks the magic of pink, and cherry lacks taste when royal unpearled. The lavender hue of dawn and of dusk seeks cheer in irises across the globe, whilst people of plum gladly pen paper busk to please Susie Giles in their purplish probe. Violet are words on the page itself to submit a sonnet to something else. Well, that's almost as good as the winner's one, isn't it? Well, look, well I know. They were honestly, they were really, really Let me good. persuade my publishers to give two copies of the book and we'll send her one as well. Aww. I think we should. God, they're brilliant, these guys. Woo! I love it. And also, it's what fun to play with words and language in that way. And there's plenty of use of, of, of sound. Oh, great. No, absolutely gorgeous. OK, mm. my trio. What shall I start with? Um, I'm going to start with something that monkeys do, that Tarzan did. And wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do this ourselves? It's to brachiate. And to brachiate, which is B-R-A-C-H-I-A-T-E, is to swing through the trees with ease. Brachiate so is a part of a tree, isn't it? It's a branch or something. It is. Is it? Exactly. But it's it's also referring to kind of your limbs, oh. I suppose, as you kind of grab one bit of this wonderful tree vine and then use it to swing to the next one. I would absolutely love to be brachiating through the forest right now. The next one is hirient, H-I-R-R-I-E-N-T. And it describes, it's an adjective, a trilling sound. So this could be the purring of a cat. This is kind of kneading your lap. Or a hirient sound might be rolling your R's, which famously I cannot do. I have tried all my life to roll my R's and I can't. And apparently it's genetic. I think we talked about this on Goodness. a previous episode. But yes, I'm definitely not hirient, unfortunately. What's the word? So that's the second one. Hirient. 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 Yes, I'm trying you to roll can, my R's You can now. roll your R's in the middle. <laughs> yeah. I can't do it. And finally, there is chirocracy. So this is the chiro is like the chiro in chiropractor. So you could say chiro, chirocracy if you like. C-H-I-R-O-C-R-A-C-Y. And chiro means the hand. So a chiropractor kind of manipulates you with the hand. And a chirocracy is a rule with the hand. In other words, by force, which seems quite relevant at the moment to rule by force. A chirocracy. Very good. It's the result of ruling by force, chirocracy, just as you might get cacistocracy or aristocracy, etc. I met someone this week who is a purple enthusiast and they keep a purple notebook. And in it, oh. they write down these words of yours. Oh, excellent. And they found that's the only way to remember them is to write them down and the definition and then try yeah. to use them. Because otherwise, oh, you know, brilliant. it's in one ear, out the other. Excellent. Have you got a poem for us? Yes. And it's from my anthology, Dancing by the Light of the Moon. It's a poem by me. And the reason I'm reciting Yay. it is I'm not frightened of bragging um, or boasting. Uh, the poem is called How to Lose Two Pounds a Week. And I'm thinking of it because I told you I could name drop for, for you know, forever. Uh, but this week I could have done a lot of name dropping from the crowned heads of Europe too. As it happens, I happened to see the Prime Minister, the British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, this week. And we were talking about trying to lose weight. Uh, because ah. it's something he uh, would, would like to lose a little bit of weight. And uh, he said, how do I lose weight? And I told him, I have this special low-carb diet. And I recited this poem for him. And I'm sharing it with you. Okay. It's by me. It's called How to Lose Two Pounds a Week by Giles Brandreth. To lose two pounds a week, to regain a figure slim and sleek. The rules are simple, if not nice. No bread, potato, and no rice. And when it comes to pasta, basta. Carbs are out, and booze is too. It's tough, but do it, and the news is you. While inwardly resentful, bitter, outwardly a lither, fitter, trimmer, slimmer, nippy, zippy, yippee. <laughs> There we are. Excellent. I can do without my carbs. No, well, um, again, moderation in all things. 
Yes. That really is the rule. Well, I'm looking for excess in all things, as you know. That's going to be my new motto. Thank you so much for everybody who has listened to us today and generally follows Something Rhymes With Purple. We really appreciate it. And, of course, you can keep following us on um, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you did like us, please do recommend us to friends or, much more importantly, please do get in touch at purple at something else.com. And, as we said, please do consider joining the Purple Plus Club if you would like for some bonus episodes. Something Rhymes with Purple is a Something Else production produced by Lawrence Bassett and Harriet Wells with additional production from Chris Skinner, Jen Mystery, Jay Beale and... Golly, I mean, I think he's off brachiating. He's got the beard, hasn't he? Yeah, he's certainly one of the swingers. 